we do have with us um, a very interesting young man who has an amazing story to share with us today. And that would be our keynote speaker, Sean Ellis. He's been featured in the recently released Netflix docuseries, Trial 4, about his journey to defend his innocence against the false conviction of the murder of a Boston police officer. Sean is a staunch advocate of criminal justice and prison reform. He co-founded the Exoneree Network and is involved with the NAACP, Violence in Boston, the Ministry of Justice, Massachusetts Community Action Network, and the Essex County Community Organizing. Sean also serves as a trustee on the board of the New England Innocence Project. Sean recently, the recently released Netflix docuseries, Trial 4, has elevated his voice internationally as he continues to speak about his experience with racism and injustice within the criminal justice system, a system that kept him behind bars for nearly 22 years for a crime he did not commit. Please join me in welcoming Sean Ellis. Sean? Good afternoon, and thank you uh, to everybody for being here. And thank you as well for that introduction. Um, as you heard, my name is Sean Ellis. Um, I am from the city of Boston, born, born and raised. In 1993, um, I was 19 years old when I was um, arrested and wrong, wrongfully accused and ultimately convicted uh, for the murder of a Boston police officer. For years, um, my attorney and I fought to uh, try to prove my innocence, but for years we were stonewalled by the blue code of silence. And so something that's not spoken about um, in the docu-series on Netflix is some of the things that I went through um, on the inside to in attempts to maintain my sanity, so to speak. In 1995, I was convicted um, after two previous juries um, were unable to, to, to reach a verdict. Um, and I was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. And I was sentenced to MCI Walpole. And when I was at Walpole, um, that was my first time that I had ever been inside of a prison. Um, but, you know, I remember walking uh, into the structure of Walpole, um, which has a pretty a pretty old, like a pretty old structure. Um, and, you know, there, there was guards around and, and, and I was I was brought into the HSU area. Um, and I was, I was, I went through the intake process. And um, they asked me, you know, how I was doing, how I was, you know, feeling. Um, at the same time that I'm trying to process um, having been convicted of a crime that I didn't commit um, and trying to process that I was sentenced to spend the remainder of my natural life in prison and trying to process like what that really what that really meant. Um, I, I awaited trial for approximately two years. So I was trying to process this as a 21 year old at the time. But once inside Walpole and you know, going through that process, um, I quickly, and, 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 and people in general, quick, quickly you know, have to, um, you have to adapt to your environment. Um, and and, and, and at, at that time in 1995, it wasn't necessarily the best of environments to try to adapt to. Um, so, on one hand, you try to establish yourself in prison so that you know you're not taken advantage of um, by 
um, the guards or the prisoners are like. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, I went through the process of, of, of trying to maintain my sanity because I knew that I had to fight against a system that was doing me wrong. Um, so you know, when you're doing time um, for various reasons, people people start out around um, and then they they life happens and they're out of your life. Um, and that's the that's things that I experienced. Um, you know, slowly but surely as time went on. And I remember when I was in, in prison, um, my younger nephew, uh, Jeffrey, he was my firstborn nephew. Um, he had, he had um, died and he didn't die any just in a natural way. He was with a group of his friends playing Russian roulette. Um, and he had mentioned that he wasn't afraid to die. And so when I got the news and I'm in prison, like I'm having to like process and try to deal with that. And I remember reaching out to, to the prison administration, um, asking for, for permission to go pay my last respects. Um, and I remember being told no. And like trying to understand like why, like why I couldn't go pay my last respects to my nephew and trying to understand that what it meant that I would never see him again. To try to understand that I wouldn't be able to have the relationship with him that I wanted to have. And so as time went on, I got more messages like that, that people close to me were passing on and that, you know, I wasn't able to pay my last respects. I remember in 2000, I want to say uh, in 2012, it was around the time of um, the incident that happened in Sandy Hook. Um, I got news that my dad had passed away. That's after hearing countless of others, my best childhood friend passed, passed, passed away, but you know, it got to the point that my dad passed away. And once again, I, I, before he had passed away, I tried to get, you know, approval to go and pay my last respects. And the prison officials told me no, that I couldn't go because of my, my sentence structure. Now, mind you, I'm in prison for a crime that I didn't, that I didn't commit. So I'm trying to process like, what do you mean my sentence structure? I don't have one. I understood that I was convicted, but I, in my mind, I didn't have a sentence structure. So people walking away, people passing on, um, you know, I, I, in a survival mode, you know, you begin to try to untach from, from, from these emotional experiences for survival because they've repeatedly happened. And, and, and you try to get yourself to the point of being numb to them. Be because if you don't, then the, 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 the circumstances just continue to victimize you. But while you unplug, you're, 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 you're really unplugging from parts of you that make you who you are. So when we speak about coping mechanisms, it's like some 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 people, you know, definitely uh, resort to self medicating. But 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 then that there is that part that you internally hurt hurt yourself. Some 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 people physic some people physically do it, uh, some people mentally do it or emotionally do it. And so I go from Walpole where, 
you know, they have two ends to the prison. You have the max end and the minimum end. And in the max end, you're locked in your cell. Um, you're out, you're out. I believe at the time it was one hour a day. You was out for one hour a day and you were locked in your cell uh, for the other 23. Within the hour, um, you have to shower. You have to make any phone calls that you have to make any business that you needed to conduct, you had to, to conduct it within that hour. So think about like socializing and what that does to one's socialization. And then you can work your way down to the minimum end where you're out for a couple of hours in the morning, a couple of hours in the afternoon and a couple of hours at night. And while I was, but while I was in prison, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a prisoner that gave the administration a whole lot of problems. Did you know, it's, 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 it's um, there was things that I was entitled to have that I wanted. Um, and I stood my ground in those regards. And for all intents and purposes, my behavior wanted, warranted me going to lower, lower security. And, 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 and I, you know, as you're doing time, you establish relationships with individuals. And so, you know, I would, I would, I would spend two years, three years uh, with an individual and then he would be transferred to another institution. And then now that's, that's, more, that's more abandonment. Like that's more takeaway. But instead of transferring me down to lower security, I got what's called a lateral move. Walpole was considered um, a level six. Um, like that was the, 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 the state's highest security level prison at the time until they um, built Susan Baranowski Correctional Center, also known as SBCC, also known as the MAX. And in the MAX, you're locked in your cell for all intents and purposes for 21 and a half hours a day. Um, I have, I have long arms, but when you think about someone's living quarters, um, that's, that's, that, that's not enough space for someone to live in. And in that space, um, that's where you sleep. That's where you store your clothes. That's where you store your food. Um, that's that. That's where you use your bathroom. No, no matter if you're in there by yourself or in there, if you're in there with someone else. And if you're in there with someone else, you have to use what you have in your environment to try to create some sense of privacy. But it gets to the point to where it's not about just about privacy; it's about humanity. And so the the imprisonment also attacks the humanity as well. But so I go from Walpole to the Mac and I'm locked in a cell for 20, 21 and a half hours a day for nine years. I spent nine, nine years in the Max. And I didn't spend nine years in the Max because my behavior warranted. I spent nine years in the Max in my belief because I was falsely accused of killing a Boston peace officer. So it, so I say it wasn't the sentence structure, structure because there were same there were there were people who had the same sentence structure that I was sentenced to, that was going down to lower security. And so, what does that spawn in my mind? That spawns in my mind that I'm different inside a prison. And how does that difference translate? It translates into my mind like, wow, if, if Massachusetts had the death penalty, I would be on death row. And so it's, it's, it's that, 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 fed in, that fed into me, like, like really understanding the seriousness of, of, of what's going on and what it is that they're trying to do to me. So I've done talks in the past where 
you know, I, I've, I've said that like, um, me, me, me be living at times and thinking about my experiences, like there's, there's like an interconnection with me and my ancestors, you know, fighting out of, out of slavery, because to me, I really fought my way out of, out of uh, slavery. How do I say that? Why do I say that? Because I was, I was, <laughs> the United States Constitution, the 13th Amendment says that slavery is abolished, except you have the exception clause. Except if one is duly convicted of a crime, it deals with slavery and involuntary servitude. I wasn't duly convicted. I was wrongfully convicted. And it doesn't matter if at the time, you know, one looks at the law and says, yeah, well, according to the law, it was, it was, it was, it was right. No, according to the law, it was wrong. And the law just wasn't practiced, but it was working the way that it was intended to work. So now it's like doing time, just really striving to reconcile that reality. We're doing for time. So after my time at the max, I was transferred to Norfolk. And once, so before going to Norfolk, you know, I did a lot of studying while at the max and, and, and and um, I ended up getting my paralegal certificate while I was while I was at the max, um, because I understood that 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 the system was trying to take my life, and I understood that the system was trying to take my life with a book, and so I knew that I had to get familiar with the books that they were using to try to take my life with. So I ended up getting my paralegal certificate, but I also did like other like other studies, um, just you know getting to know myself better, um, trying trying to pour into myself, trying to pour into my humanity. There was there was a um, book that I read called The Community Itself, um, and another important book that I read was As a Man Think of, uh, because as as, as there was an attack on my humanity and as there was an attack on my soul and as th there was an attack on my mental health, like, like just in intuitively, I realized that I had to pour back in, into myself in some kind of way. I didn't know at the time it was me pouring in myself, but I can look back and say today that that's what it was. Be because my, my spirit knew that there was an attempt to crush it. My spirit knew that there was an attempt to bury it, to murder it off. And so it was my spirit that took over. And when people say, well, I, you know, I, I can't believe that you're not angry, Sean. It, it, it isn't so much a matter of anger versus non-anger. Because, you know, anger can be used in a positive way. Anger can be used to fuel a whole movement. Anger can be used to push back against a system that's trying to crush you and kill you off. The, 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 the thing is that if you don't identify it as anger, when you're asked, are you angry? You say, no, I'm not angry. But in reality, it's, 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 it's a, righteous, a righteous fuel. And because you're, you're after, if you're angry, then you start to ask yourself, well, am I angry? I do have some kind of feelings about it. I do feel a certain way about it. But the way I feel about it isn't the, 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 the expression of it isn't identified with anger. And so you question, is the person angry? Is they're not angry? because there's an expectation of what that anger is supposed to look like. I 
after the max, I went to Norfolk and when I got to Norfolk, um, the prison environment was different. Um, I, 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 I struggle to say this, but I'll, I'll say that this, the, the, the exterior setup looked, looked, looked something like, um, like an old college type of dorm. Um, and in the middle of the prison, it had what's called the quad, which, you know, it's a circle and you can walk around the quad and the landscape of the quad is nice and everything. So it was different. And, um, excuse me, and, and, and in the cells at Norfolk, they didn't lock, which, um, had, had spooked me up. The cells at Norfolk didn't lock. And so for me, it spooked me up. Because I was used, I had become used to being locked in a cell. With, with, with limited access to me because I'm locked in a cell. And so because I'm locked in a cell, someone who has the key would have been responsible for, you know what I mean? But at Norfolk, I'm in a cell which is, that doesn't lock. So it's, it's, it's it, it's not close to being home, but there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a degree of freedom in that. I can walk out the cell if I want to, even though it was against the rules. Because, which was a crazy rule, and I was about to go down a rabbit hole of explaining the rule, but it's, it's, it's irrelevant to this conversation. But it spooked me out and, 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 and you know, you think about ways of jimmying, jimmying the door. So, so you get back into that space that you're comfortable with because you, you become comfortable with being locked in the cell. The thing that I was about to explain about Norfolk and the, the, the physical setup is, is that in the programming, um, is that that environment was the closest environment that I had experienced in that time as being close, close, like close to being on the, like close to being on the um, street, close to being home. And I struggled to say that too, because it's like you're locked up and you know you're locked up and you know that people have control over you can come and snatch you up and ship you anywhere that they want at any time. Like that's, that, that doesn't lose, that doesn't leave your mind. But the social interaction at Norfolk was different than it was at, 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 at Walpole or at SBCC. Um, you know, the prisoner was allowed to, um, run, to run, if you will, a lot of, pro, uh, a lot of programs. So, so, so there was a degree of, of, of trying to involve yourself into self healing. And there was, you know, there's, there's, there's some connection with self healing. But in prison, you have to be careful because you don't want to be too vulnerable. You don't want to be too open. But at, at, the, at the same time, you know that you're in an environment that you, that you don't belong. It's it's a bunch it's it's a it's a bunch of craziness. Like you're in an environment that you know that you don't belong in, but just you know you're socializing with, with, with people and you're seeing their pain and you're connecting with with their pain and you're connecting with a relationship that's based on pains someone in, in a in a bad or worse situation as you so people trying to trying to survive and and then there are instances where you reach out to the administration for help 
and you think because you're trying to do the right thing, because you're trying to do the positive thing, because you're trying to do something that's going to benefit society as a whole, that they're going to give you all the support that they can possibly give you. But when you go in and ask them, a lot of times you're told no. Or you look at it as though you're trying to get over. So I go from Norfolk in 2013, I overturned my case by the, you know, because of the diligent work of um, my two attorneys, Rosemary Scafficio and Jalice McDonough, um, along with myself. And I went to Nashua Street um, where I spent um, a couple of months at Nashua Street um, awaiting to be bailed out. Um, and I come home and I remember walking to going to the supermarket with my mom and um, we had we had we were taking public transportation and so you know that was an, ex, an experience in and of itself but I remember we was walking down the street and she wanted to cut through this alleyway um, that that just didn't didn't it didn't it looked different um, and I remember asking her like that, that isn't out of bounds like like we're allowed to walk to walk down here um and what out of bounds came from is that in prison there's there's even though the whole prison is behind the wall that I don't know how tall this wall is but it's behind the wall there's certain areas, certain sections that you can't go into because if you go into, it's considered being out of bounds and then now a disciplinary action ensues. So I asked my mom, I said, that's not out of bounds. So now I'm taking and I'm, trans I'm transferring the conditioning that I, that I went through while being in prison to, to out here in the world. I haven't stopped yet to think about what was the internal messaging that I received from the presence of the GPS that was on, on my ankle? Because although I was, I was bailed out and I'm because of the community, not even my, 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 my family, but because of the, the community put up money towards bailing, bailing me out for $50,000, like this, like that wasn't enough. There had to be a, 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 a GPS monitor on my ankle for an additional three years as we continue to fight the case um, with my being out on bail. But I remember, you know, early on after I had came home, um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, it's, this is what it was called at the time, but, you know, my family, you know, did an intervention um, be, because they were I, identifying things about me that, you know, I wasn't identifying about myself. And, um, we had a little meeting and, you know, they were sharing with me, you know, their concerns. And I, I remember seeing, you know, during that meeting that, um, if my thinking worked to me while I was in prison, why why would I start to think a different way now that I'm home? If it got me through all that time and that hell that I was in prison, if 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 my thinking if 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 my thinking you know kept me safe and sane and and, and, and feeling and feeling safe on the inside, like why 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 in the world would I let that go? And, you know, they couldn't answer that. And it took, it took me over the time to, 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 to kind of begin to, to, to think in a different way. I, I want to say to assimilate with being out here, but I, I don't necessarily think that I've necessarily assimilated. You know, if you follow if you follow me on social media, you might 
see me make a post from time to time that says that I'm different. Because I've gone through an experience and I know that it has whooped up on me. I, I, I just haven't gone to school to be able to speak the language and, and say, yeah, it's done it in this way. But let's walk down this journey because there was a time when I came home that I was seeking um, like some, some mental health counseling because I want to understand like, you know, me on the inside. And, 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 and instead of just trying to heal myself in a whole in general way, but like, I, I want to, I want to have some bits, some, some, some benchmarks because I know that I've gone through a lot. And so I attempted to connect with a counselor and, you know, I'm sitting and, and, and I'm talking to him. And that was, that was one of the worst experiences for me, not because the guy wasn't a good guy, not because he wasn't a good listener, but because he had an inability to connect. He could hear me. He was listening, but we wasn't connecting. And so I, you know, I start to think like, man, can this dude even relate to what I'm saying to, to him? Could he like, is it realistic to him? Cause I've gone through a lot. And the inability to connect with this person kind of pushed me away from seeking, seeking, seeking some mental health. For a while. All while knowing that it's something that I want. Like, like I want, like I want somebody to, to you know, I call it kicking it with. I want somebody to talk to. But after talking to this gentleman, you know, I, I said to myself, like, all, all right, well, I want this help, but now this next person has to get past even the more, the more lack of trust. Because I didn't open up and got vulnerable and and, and shared and and and, and all to, to kind of not having been connected. And so now is 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 as I go to my next experience and I'm trying to connect with some with somebody else who has a Google number. And 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 it was referred by a person that I had trusted. So I'm thinking, yeah, well, you, you know, I'm off to a good start. And, and I'm calling the Google number. First flag. Then the person doesn't answer the call. Last flat. I said, okay, well, let me let me play this out. I already know that we're not kicking it, but let me play this out. So now we're playing for like a phone tag, a phone tag. Man. And so I get more out of this then I've gotten out of really connecting, like connecting with, 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 with somebody in a way that I'm desirous of connecting. And so you, you, you know, you take the desire and the want for mental health and, you know, you compound that on, you get out here in the world that is different from the world that you left with the technology piece and so now it's like, that's, that's more stress. And then you're out here and you're still fighting the case. And you're still hearing the lies from the Commonwealth. And the police are still up to their dirty tricks. And you still can't find somebody to talk to. You're trying to, you know, you, 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 you can't catch up 
because the world's always moving, but you know, you, you're you trying to grab hold to a world that's moving. So at, so at least you can try to plan the foundation. But that's a problem because you can't find that help. And so when you hear the phrase wounded but not broken, you know, it's 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 that spirit. It is that 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 understanding that no, I've I've been hurt and I have traumas that I have identified, I have traumas that have gone unidentified. Um, but because I'm tapped into the spirit and the spirit is what's holding me up and the spirit is what's driving me. It's like you're calling the phrase wounded but not broken. That's really what's, 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 what's in the quintessence of, 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 of one that's wounded but not broken. Because if it's 22 years of a wrongful incarceration, if it's 28 years fighting against a, 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 a system that's ex, ex, expressing the maximum amount of racism that it can, whether it's one that's been ass assaulted in one way, shape, or form. If it's if it's one that's that that's fighting be, being abandoned in in, in, DC, in the DCF system, it's and one that continues to fight it and to push forward. It's like that. That's one that's 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 exercising the spirit of, of, of maybe being wounded, but not broken. And so I'll stop on that note and um, take some take some questions. I, I, I would like to leave some 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 time to you know have some questions so we can engage in the back and forth. Wonderful, Sean. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, you've kept everyone riveted for the past um, half hour or so. Thank you very much for being vulnerable with us and open to sharing your story. Um, you raised some very, very awesome points that I just, I had to take note of that I wanted to reiterate. Um, you, you know, you said using anger as righteous fuel. And that's, that's very true. We um, often think that, you know, we shouldn't be angry. We shouldn't feel that way. Um, sometimes anger can be useful and good um, as a catalyst to spark change and to spark action. So yeah, definitely thank you for that. And, um, and you brought something to my mind when you were speaking about um, your experience in, in the prison where the door, while the doors were unlocked, you knew that you weren't allowed to leave um, because you know prison can be deeper than just four walls of a cell. We can sometimes be imprisoned in our and um, oftentimes feel comfortable staying there. Um, it reminded me of a situation where um, there was a line drawn on the ground and people started standing behind it. No one questioned why it was there. They just, we've learned, we stand behind lines, especially this past year. And um, it, it, was, it was amazing to see that study and how people were conditioned to just stand behind it and not question. Um, and so, yeah, definitely um, freeing our minds to the point where we can, we can think outside of that box. Truly amazing, truly amazing. Um, so are there any questions? Um, please use the raise your hand feature um, on your Zoom. We'll entertain some questions. I don't think I've seen any in the chat. Um, all right, here we go. We've got Robert. Okay, go ahead, Robert. I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, first and foremost, young man, I just want to um, say your journey is phenomenal. Um, I, I don't, 
as a person that has spent 15 years in prison and understand the, the magnitude of the conditioning, I, I want you to always hold your head up, even on your worst day. Because what, you, what you've done, whether you were, uh, as you fought for your innocence or in, even for the individuals that have made mistakes and that were guilty, overcoming that, overcoming that conditioning, it shows a, a level of your resilience that can't be measured. The studies don't even know how to address that yet. So you're a phenomenal person. Uh, your understanding and, and your comment in regards to the 13th Amendment is something that we're still fighting right now in regards to the, the justice system and incarceration and what it means. You know, I, I'm, a stark, I'm a stark believer that rehabilitation is supposed to start the same day that you're convicted. Not when you hit the streets 10 years later, because you're, you're, you're being turned into something you were never designed to be, if you're not as strong as you were, Sean. So my hat goes off to you. I respect you. I respect what you did with your life. I respect the development that you found as a man, because that's one of the things that, as an African-American man that we find ourselves doing, learning how to be a man and not to be the man. Kudos. Love you, bro. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Okay, next up we have uh, Randy. All right, well, Randy, looks like you're still on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Good, that was good practice for me to ask my question. Sean, <laughs> I wanted to say thank you so much for uh, making yourself so vulnerable to shine a light on such a dark thing. You know, it, it just, it hurts my heart to hear it. Um, and I didn't truly understand it as much as I do now. So thank you so much. That's not easy to do. I wanted to ask you how you are today, how you are tomorrow and going forward. Oh, Sean, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Um, how I am um, is literally wounded but not broken. Um, and so, some days are, are, are better than others, but every day is different. Um, you know, over the last couple of weeks, um, I have been more more thoughtful of 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 of, of, of self healing and, and and taking time for myself in that sort of way. Um, And, and doing it, doing it from for me. Um, and, and, and that that has been rewarding. But you know, um, you know, I I I try to go forward in life um, with a positive disposition, and and and, and but realizing that there's parts of me um, that you know need help and need work. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, in the chat, um, we do have a quick question for you, Sean. Um, I believe you mentioned two books and they were wondering if you could drop the names of those books in the chat. No problem. Um, any other questions? All right, Charlene. Sure, 
Oh, Sharon. Okay. You should be able to unmute yourself now, Sharon. Sharon? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, so I was just wondering, um, first of all, um, I wanted to thank you, Sean, for sharing um, your life with us. And, and as some of the other um, guests have said, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Um, you have an amazing story and you have an amazing light about you that <clears throat> it's truly um, an inspiration to hear your journey. I'm just curious, um, and I may have missed this because I stepped away to go to the restroom. If there were um, outside of like when you were released um, from prison, was there ever an op was there ever an invitation for you um, from the correctional facilities or um, institution to offer mental health as part of your healing process? And um, second question is, do you ever do other speaking engagements? Um, so when I came home, um, I, I, I got, you know, healthcare, um, I got connected with a CPC, um, P, P, a PCP, um, and, 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 um, you know, we, we had some conversations about it, but, um, I'm not talking to somebody that I can't understand, like that can't understand me, like that's just not going to happen. Um, and 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 you know it's an it's unfortunate, but that's where I am now. Um, you know the person has to to qualify their ability to 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 understand me. Um, you know, not necessarily having have gone through what I've gone through because you know I I I understand that you know the average person won't go through what I've gone through. Um, but, you know, you have to see me as a human being. You can't see me as a patient, a client, like, like we're not doing that no more. Like that's part of, that's part of what got me feeling the way that I feel going through the things that I go through is, is, is if, if we're not connecting in a, in a real sort of way um, as a human and, and energetically, um, then, 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 you know, I've, I've, I've resolved myself to the point that I'm not talking to you. And so I'll continue to try to, you know, um, do what I can to help myself, um, before I allow that to happen. Um, because I have a problem with being vulnerable. Um, I have a, I have a problem with at this point, like always trying to do the right thing. Because when I went to the police station in 1993 to 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 to, to talk to them about my two cousins that were murdered, um, you know that changed the trajectory the trajectory um, for 28 years of my life. So we're not doing that again. So so that's some of that's some of my stuff that I got to work through. And I understand that, and this is what I mean when I say that I'm doing the work, you know, on myself. Because when I identify it, then I, I identify it. But you know, I still have to get to the point within myself to, 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 to be safe enough to kind of make that connection. But the person has a role to play in that as well. Um, did I answer your question? All right, wonderful. Okay, thank you for that. And next up we have, don't want to butcher the name, Bibi. Hello. Um, hi, Sean. Uh, first, thank you for um, sharing um, your story. And I, I saw the trial for when it first came out. And I can't believe I'm talking to you. I'm so excited. Um, I hope you are. Um, you know how resilient and powerful you are. I really hope that for you. Um, and you know what? All this made your your you talking made me understand that the importance. I know that I knew it, but the importance of having that connection as peer supporters or um, in any uh, support um, position we have, um, the, you haven't had that connection because you maybe you haven't found the person that 
that you can connect to and say, this is someone that has gone through what I've gone through. So um, definitely uh, brings a lot to me about that. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I know you went in when you were 19. Um, so did you sense or feel or see any type of change in the prison system in the health, um, I mean, in the mental health as you, as the years went on, was there a, a bit of change of proposal or some help or some groups that can help you with mental health inside prison? Uh, so when I, when I was being held at Nashua Street, um, there was, you know, people that, that, you know, was dealing with mental health issues. Um, but, but, um, you know, there were, there were, you know, there were, there were people were seeing that people were being over medicated. And so now you start to look at, you, you know, mental health, um, and the treatment of mental health as, as, as something to get high. And, 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 and even if the person isn't high, that's just the perception like, oh, damn, those meds got that person high. And so the medication, you know, be, be, becomes the Therazine shuffle. And so now you start, you start looking like, man, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to mental health. You know what I mean? And so has, has it like has it gotten better over the years? I don't believe that it's gotten better because one of the problems um, in terms of the perception of, of the mental health staff is that the mental health staff shares private information with the correctional staff. And then now um, that, 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 that information, not only does the person that's in prison have to deal with being in prison, he has to deal with the added, the added stuff that's, that, that's on top of it. And so there's that, that stigma that if you're dealing with, with mental health, that you're not strong, that you can't take it. Because between you and your man, y'all got to be able to figure it out. Y'all got to be able to figure out your mental health. But it's like the blind leading the blind. Be, be, because the culture towards mental health in prison doesn't make the mental health decision a safe decision. Not to say that you, you get physically hurt, but your your reputation, your bravado, your 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 ability to stand on your own too. In terms of do I do have a speaking engagements? Um, I I I do have a website, um, trialford.com, um, and 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 you feel free to visit my website um, if you want to contact me. There's a a tab in there, um, contact us that will allow you to uh, con contact me. But yes, I do do have a speaking engagements. Right, Sean, thank you for that. Um, we do have a question in the chat before I get to Hafsa. Um, Chez would like to know if in the meantime, while you're waiting for um, a professional therapist to talk to, if you've considered exploring um, speaking with uh, a peer support person. So someone who's not necessarily, you know, gone through the exact same situation, but someone who's been through, um, you know, PTSD, depression, that sort of thing. So thank you for that question. Um, I am, I am um, you know, as you heard, um, a trustee on the board of the New England Innocent Project, and I'm also the co-founder of the Exonery Network. And um, what 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 we're striving to do um, within that network is to provide some wraparound services um, that we haven't received as ex exonerees. The exoneree experience is you go from being locked up to being released, um, and so we don't receive the the, the 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 same services that someone who's being released on probation or parole. Um, we just put out a prison to, to go find somewhere to live. As a matter of fact, 
um, when I was released and I'm thankful. Um, but when I was, you know, trying to be released, working on being released, I couldn't even find housing um, because nobody wanted me staying in their property. And so um, my mother's, the youth pastor at my mother's church, um, him and his family were kind enough to open a door for me. Um, but, you know, if you really listen to my story, you can imagine I went from, you know, being in a cell in prison to being in the house um, out here in the world. Um, but I spent the majority of my time in that room because I didn't feel, um, I didn't feel necessarily comfortable enough. And that might not be the word, but that's the best word for the time. Um, I didn't feel comfortable enough to go socialize um, with the family in, 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 in the living room. Um, and, 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 but we was cordial enough. Um, we, 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 we shared food, we, we, we shared experiences, but we didn't share that, ex, that ex, experience. And so, um, yeah. So the Exonery Network, um, part of, you know, what we're trying to do is to provide um, the kind of peer support um, that one Exonery can uh, provide to another. Um, and where we're trying to find different, different, I'll call them products, if you will. We're find, trying to find different, different products, different, different styles or different types, um, different, different tools that we can use uh, to offer that kind of support. Um, but you know, we do have what we call, like what what, what I call for the sake of this, um, like healing circles and things of that nature. That's wonderful. It's wonderful when people can come together and empower each other and support one another. Um, and kind of what um, everyone's been talking about in terms of what would really help the mental health system is having more providers that, you know, look like the people they're serving that have a shared kind of cultural background. So it's easier to relate to them, right? Um, okay, next question. I would, like to, I would like to add this too, um, to the extent that it may be beneficial. Um, we do work with some people um, from, from the mental health field, uh, we being Exonery Network, um, you know, because we do know that there is not a lot of relatability um, within the mental health field um, and, and, and in the experience, there's not much known about it. And so we are working with, with, with um, some, you know, small group of mental health people as we try to, you know, provide this wraparound service. Wonderful. Um, I want to say um, somehow through um, the grace of a higher power than me, we have managed to get back on schedule. So we are we are right where we need to be time wise, which is wonderful. Um, Sean, um, I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, it has been a pleasure getting to know you over these past few months and um, what you shared today was truly remarkable.